Good afternoon and good evening to everyone. My name is Dave Frankowski and I'll be your moderator for today's class. And welcome to another lecture given by the Oceanside California class. This is a school and not a church. Neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. The school is a nonprofit, non-denominational, religious and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh our Elohim and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. The school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given unto our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley in the state of Ohio in the year of 1931. We were incorporated in the state of California in the year of 1958, and we hold classes in the United States and in various other countries. The Oceanside class was established in 1994. At this time, I'd like to introduce to you the Dean of the Oceanside class, Dr. Dennis Volpe, and the president, Dr. Carl Emler. Now in this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title for the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The correct name for our Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord. The correct title for the Word or Son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted by God. And the correct name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles. They are not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and there are God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name, and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike the titles of Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. It's a divine title because it's the title that our Creator has chosen for Himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name, and a minor investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew, the Greek, nor the Latin languages have any letters or characters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that's made by the letter J. Neither was there a letter J in our own English language until some 1400 years after the death of the Messiah, which would make such names as Jesus and Jehovah impossible renderings for the true name of our Father and his Son. Christ is a title just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state, he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, the limits and the bounds of everything that exists. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state, symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. And we've drawn this cloud to extend all around the edges of the chart to show that everything on the chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh knowing that man could not perceive of him in his pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself, and Yahweh Elohim. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal being, that is, having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form could only be seen in divine visions and understood in divine revelations. Later on, this self-same spirit, manifested himself in a physical body, and he walked the earth plain as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the whole world calls Jesus Christ. 
Now there's only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question that we should ask ourselves is, what did they call the Savior when he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface to the Holy Name Bible. Also in this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It's the divine pattern because it's Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, he called Moses on top of Mount Sinai, and he showed him this threefold tabernacle pattern in a vision. Later on, Yahweh instructed Moses to build one in the wilderness of Sinai, exactly like the one he had seen in his vision on the mount. The tabernacle pattern is a threefold pattern consisting of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court round about. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof that everything in the universe is made and it operates according to the structure and the function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. The school has 10 primary constitutional objectives and aims, and they are as follows. One, to help you find and know Yahweh our Elohim as he really is and actually exists. Two, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah, without distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Three, to investigate the unexplained spirit law, or so-called law of nature, and the powers latent in man. Four, to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. Five, to extirpate current super superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Six, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seven, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons, operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eight, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith, which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Nine, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained. There is no other name given among men whereby a man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And ten, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace, and our slogan is speak the truth. We'll begin this afternoon with a prayer by Dr. Bruce Geller from our Oceanside class, and we'll have a scripture read, which will be 2 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, and that'll be read by Dr. Jerry Geller from our Oceanside class. Thank you, Dave. Good afternoon and evening to everyone. May we all bow our hearts and minds in a moment of prayer and let us first thank our Heavenly Father Yahweh, who again has seen fit to bring us all together in the spirit of Yahshua the Messiah. And we are so grateful, Yahweh, for you having chosen us out of the world and taken us out of the darkness and it is a real darkness that is in this world, taking us out of that and have brought us into your marvelous light and this great gospel that we're a part of. And we're so grateful for you having chosen us, not because of anything that we have done or could do, but just simply because you loved us and had mercy on us. And we're so appreciative. All we can do is just continue to praise you and to preach your gospel unto the very end. 
We ask that you give us the strength to endure because these are very tough times that we're in right now and we need you, Yahweh, more than we ever have before. And we're just, uh, we're just calling on you constantly to help us because you truly are our helper. We ask you to help us with our infirmities and many of us have these infirmities and we know that you are the healer, the real true and honest to goodness healer. And we're so grateful that we have access unto that great Holy Spirit that you have made available to us. And we're just grateful for it. And we want to thank you. And we want to always keep you in our thoughts on a constant basis. And just to be grateful for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon all of us. These things we thank you for and ask you for in the name of our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah. Let us all say. Amen. Good evening, class. Tonight's scripture will be 2 Corinthians, the sixth chapter. I'll be reading from the Holy Name Bible. Correction, the Jerry. Jerry, the scripture I want, and I'm sorry I made a mistake, is the fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians. All right. Then uh, the scripture lesson will be Second Corinthians, the fifth chapter. I'll be reading from the Holy Name Version, the Holy Name Bible, containing the Holy Name Version of the Old and New Testaments, critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts, revised by A.B. Trena of the Scripture Research Association, Incorporated. That would be Second Corinthians, the fifth chapter. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of Elohim, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is Elohim, who also hath given unto us the pledge of the Spirit. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from Yahweh. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with Yahweh. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted by him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of the Messiah, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of Yahweh, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto Yahweh, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. For if we be beside ourselves, it is to Elohim. And if we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of the Messiah constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known the Messiah after the flesh, now henceforth know we him no more. 
Therefore, if any man be in the Messiah, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of Yahweh, who hath reconciled us to himself by Yahshua the Messiah, and hath given us to the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that Yahweh was in the Messiah, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for the Messiah, as though Elohim did beseech you by us. We pray you in the Messiah's stead, be ye reconciled to Yahweh. For he hath made him to be sin offering for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of Yahweh in him. Second Corinthians, the fifth chapter. Thank you, Dr. Jerry Geller and Dr. Bruce Geller. Our scripture readers this afternoon will be Dr. Deb Cometti from our Syracuse class and Dr. Gail Josephson from our Green Bay class. We'll have a three speaker format this afternoon each speaker getting approximately 35 minutes. And our first speaker this afternoon will be Dr. Sharon Welch from our Syracuse class. Hi, everyone. I had a feeling. <laughs> Always had those feelings. It's really good to uh, be here tonight. Um, got a lot of uh, brethren on our Zoom. Um, it's really nice to gather together in Yahshua's name. Um, this scripture reading here tonight is uh, really loaded with a lot of uh, principles that um, <clears throat> you uh, can have an understanding. Um, and the thing that comes to mind is... Um, is life after death. Uh, what he's talking about here, Paul, is you know how uh, we have something more than this physical uh, being that we're, you know, like the prayer said, you know, we're all in trying, just enduring to the end. Uh, most of us are getting old and our bodies are breaking down. But when it comes to understanding the spirit of the thing, you know, we're just all just renewed. And uh, that's the only thing that keeps us going. What I'd like to do, though, is um, back up a little bit and uh, lay, lay a foundation for this scripture reading. And what I would like to do is uh, try to run down what Yahshua was actually doing and walking in a physical body. And, you know, it's just amazing to me that this is a mystery and the world does not understand. First of all, they got the name wrong. And secondly, they've got his purpose wrong. They don't understand what exactly he was doing coming into the flesh. Now, we know we teach down here the unity of the spirit. You know, it's not a trinity. You don't have three separate individual personalities that make up the Godhead or the supernal nature. We teach down here that uh, the Godhead is a unity. Um, and let's just get a witness on that. First uh, John five and seven. And then we'll get John one and one, just give, give a witness to that. Cause you know, we say down here that we, you know, we don't want you to believe what we say. And that's what Dr. Kinley said. Don't believe me. I've had a vision, make me prove it. 
he, he didn't say, I had a vision and you believe me. No, he said, make me prove it. And that's what we stick to down here is to try and prove the things that we say. It's impossible to get uh, witnesses for everything that we say, but for the important things, I think that it's important to um, pull out some of those witnesses. So um, let's see, I want First John first, please. First John five and seven. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. So there are three that bear record in heaven. Now, we also learn down here that heaven isn't um, a physical, uh, a place, you know, it's a state of mind. But when he's talking about here is, you know, uh, Yahweh in um, being in that spirit state. So there are three there bear record in heaven. And he says the word, right, Gail? The word. The, fa the, father, the, 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 word. Mm -hmm. the father, the word. The father, the word, and the Holy Spirit. So those yeah. are the three that uh, most Christianity will say that they're separate individual personalities. But that's not what the scriptures say. It says that these three are what? And these three are one. These three are one. So it's a unity. See, and then there's a witness in the earth. Keep, uh, keep going. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree in one. So they agree in one, which means that they are a unity too. And it's the blood, the water, and the spirit, which you can run down through um, all the scriptures, uh, principles of that but they all agree in one, so they're a unity too. So let's just run over and get John one and one, another witness of this unity. And this, this, is, this is important to understand, you know, to understand how Yahweh exists. And that's our first aim, is to help you find and know Yahweh as he really is and actually exists. And that's what we're trying to show you down here is how he actually exists. So um, let's pick up John one and one. And if we can go to the Moses chart and zoom in on that uh, top uh, with the vision of Moses. John one and one. In the beginning was the word and the word was with Yahweh and the word was Yahweh. So the in, the begin in the beginning, I'm sorry, Deb. In the beginning was the word. So in the beginning of the creation, see, was the word. And that word you see over here that we have uh, Yah Elohim being the word. When the moderator went through the uh, names, it says that the Elohim is a, is a title, see, and it's, and it is the word or son. So in the beginning was the word. And the word was with Yahweh. And the word was with Yahweh. And the word was Yahweh. And the word was Yahweh. So you see that that is the same. They, Elohim and Yahweh are the same. And then go down to 14 and we'll zoom down on the chart. And it says... And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And okay, we so, so the word, Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. So that is Yahshua, the Messiah. So there you go. There is the, that unity of the Godhead and that is how Yahweh exists. He exists in a, visionary shape and form as the moderator told you and it also he also comes down into the flesh it's the same thing uh there's a uh, uh sound cloud there that what dr kinley says you could you can hear him kind of like banging on the charts and saying it's yahweh over here and you could tell he's you know he's banging on the chart you know that it's 
um, in the cloud. And he says, and is Yahweh over here, Elohim, and that's Yahweh. And it says, Yahshua, he goes, that's Yahweh too. So though, you know, that is what the Godhead is. It's a unity. So <clears throat> Yahshua coming in the flesh, see, has a purpose. He's manifesting Yahweh, see, in the flesh, because that's who he is, okay? That's what's within him. He had to come down and divest himself from that uh, that that spirit that was in him and Elohim, see, and he had to come down into the flesh for a purpose. Now the world is telling you that he came down to uh, set up a Christian way of life. And when you look up the name Jesus, that's exactly what they tell you is that he came in to um, establish a Christian way of life. Now, when I found out and I looked up myself that Christianity wasn't even uh, invented, I'd, I'll say, when Yahshua was walking around in the flesh. It came in in, in uh, was it was it 300s? See, there was no Christians walking around with Yahshua. It wasn't even anything. It wasn't there. He he wasn't Christian. See, he was he was made of the law, made of a woman, made of the law, and he was a, a Hebrew. And that's why we say that his name had to be Yahshua, it can't be Jesus, because there's no J in the Hebrew language. So you, you see that he was not, <clears throat> he was not an Italian Catholic. That's what I thought when I went to church, because we went to a, a, you know, an Italian church. And that's all we knew. And I didn't realize. And when I found that out, I was amazed. I'm like, you're kidding me. This is, this is for real. You look it up yourself. And that's the only way you're going to get that revelation. Because I can say it until I'm blue in the face. But until you see it, you know, and you look it up and you see it, the witness. See, it'll just blow you away. <clears throat> so Yahshua came in for a purpose, and it's not to set up a Christian way of life. So let's get a couple of the witnesses where um, he came in to fulfill. I don't want to uh, uh, labor on that too much, but we can get Matthew 3.13. We can get uh, Luke. Let's get a couple of those witnesses for me, please. Matthew 3.13. Then cometh Yahshua from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? Okay, excuse me. This is, this is a biggie, see? Baptism. You, you just, in any kind of religion out here, see, there's always some kind of baptism, and it's always with water, okay? Now, Yahshua came in and yes, he was baptized, but you can also read, and I don't remember where it is, but we can get it for you, um, where it says that Yahshua never baptized anybody. He didn't baptize, he was baptized <laughs> by John and the reason that John was commissioned to um, start the baptism, so he's the one that uh, instituted uh, the water baptism to take away sin, see? And so people would come to him and say that they sinned, and then he would have to baptize them to get rid of that sin. 
now yash and that's that's the reason why i know in the catholic church is that a, a baby has to be baptized because he's born with the original sin i don't know where they got that from you know it's just not true it's just false it's false doctrine they and uh that's the reason why they baptize well here john is instituting water baptism and he's not just baptizing babies you see so when they came to him and said you know i sinned and so john would baptize them but when yashua came and he says, you know, if you sinned and Yahshua didn't sin, there was no sin in him. So John, that's why John's reaction is, is this, is that, you know, you come to me to be baptized. I, you know, you should be baptizing me. So pick that up again, please, Gail. Matthew 3 and 13. Thank you. Then, come, then cometh Yahshua from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? Right. And Yahshua answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. No, then he's got to institute a Christian way of life. Mm -hmm. That's not what he's saying. I, mm -hmm. We have to suffer it to be so now for us, for becometh us to fulfill. Fill. Mm -hmm. the, he's come to fulfill, not to set up, not to institute. Institute means to start. Fulfill means to end. Simple. It's just so simple. And, you know, sometimes the simplicity is a gift for someone to see. It's amazing. You know, I had a, I had a, a speech uh, course in college. So we had to do some, we had to do a, a presentation and I did the tabernacle pattern and how everything went by threes. And after I was done, the professor said, well, it's kind of uh, too logical. And I'm like, logical, what are you talking about? <laughs> and it is <laughs> it's simplicity and it's you know how can you not see that but see it's a gift to see it i'm telling you it's just a gift uh it's a revelation from yashua himself so let's go get one more in luke if that's where you are or john whichever one you're at uh, yeah um do you just want the part about fulfill or do you want yes. about okay so that would be luke 24 44 Thank you. And this is Joshua. He said unto them, these are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. See, everything had to be fulfilled that was written in the law, which is the first five books of Moses, and then in the prophets, which are the 33 books of the prophets. See, everything... Um, that was set up and actually in a in a SoundCloud tape, Dr. Kinley said that everything really was instituted back in the cloud. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> it just had to be manifested, see, but in the law and in the prophets. And that's where it was instituted and the law and the prophets and then Yahshua came in to fulfill, not to institute. So what happens now after he comes in um, to fulfill the Old, Old Testament or the law and the prophets? Now what? You see, we don't go, we don't go and do all of those physical uh, worshiping. Um, let me get uh, John 4, 24. I mean, I'm just trying to lay a foundation. I'm not getting into anything that probably most of you people on the Zoom haven't heard before. Uh, but, you know, this is going out on YouTube, so you never know who's listening. So John 4 and 24, or 23, pick it up at 23, please. 
but the hour comes and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the father in spirit and in truth mm -hmm. for the father seeketh such to worship him. 24 Yahweh is spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So now after the death, burial and resurrection of Yahshua, the Messiah, it's been, there's been a change. There's a change that happened that the world is in darkness about, you know, and Bruce talked about that darkness and, you know, the physical uh, iniquity and evil that we see out in this world, that's darkness. But you know what? That's just a manifestation of the darkness that's in man's mind and heart. They just don't know Yahweh, you know, and his purpose. That's the true darkness that uh, the physical is manifesting, see? And it's just getting worse and worse. So, oh boy, how did I get off of that? Um, so he seeks them, he seeks people that will, uh, worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, wait, I was taught that I, we, the, we go to church and we do all of the sacraments. If we can get the uh, carnal owners chart up, please. And we can do all of this in the Old Testament. See, it's the Old Testament's fulfilled. We're just working with that. The New Testament is written in the heart and mind. So that Old Testament, see, all of those ceremonies and all of that stuff that was done back then, see, it's not the way it is now because Yahweh seeks them that worship him in spirit and in truth. So there's nothing about spirit in that Old Testament and those carnal ordinances. Okay? It's all physical. It's a physical worshiping. And there's been a change that the world does not understand. The world does not see the purpose of Yahshua on that cross. They don't get it. And it's amazing. And, and the reason, you know, I used to have crosses all over my house, you know, right, Pat, Rick? Mm -hmm. I had crosses, you know, they wear them around their necks. Why? That's the death. I never realized, you know, that we were worshiping that death. And Yahshua, there's something more to that. See, the death, burial, and resurrection of Yahshua the Messiah brought on a, a change. And that change, you know, let me get, um, I want to get Colossians now to the cross. Is it four, three? <laughs> Can't remember. 2 10, oh. Colossians 2 10. Thank you. Looking at the chart, and I'm trying Down to. On the chart, yep. <laughs> I can't see it though, it's too small. Colossians 2 and 10, and ye are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. See, I said that. The circumcision now, see, it was done by hands, of course. But now, what? Circumcision without hands? What's that? See, it's a spiritual circumcision because that just that circumcision is revealing the head, right? Well, that spiritual circumcision is revealing the head, which is Yahshua in your heart and mind. That's the spiritual circumcision. And that's how we worship him in spirit and in truth. So keep going, please. Yeah. With a circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh mm -hmm. by the circumcision of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Buried with him in baptism. Now in we're which... buried in him in baptism. We don't need to do that anymore. 
See, we're buried in him in baptism. He was baptized, but he never baptized anybody. And if somebody can grab that real quick, uh, we, we were not, he was not setting up baptism because he never did. He never baptized anyone. Does somebody have that real quick? Because I know I only have a few minutes. John 4 and 12. 4 and 2. Thank you, Sasha. John 4 and 2. John 4 and 2. Though Yahshua himself baptized not, but his disciples. That's right. Yahshua himself did not baptize anybody. Mm -hmm. See? So we're buried in him in baptism. In which yeah. also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of Yahweh mm -hmm. who has raised him from the dead. Right. You being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he made alive or quickened together with him having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. So I'm sorry, Deb. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. See on this uh, uh, left hand side of the chart here, the Old Testament down at the bottom, these are all ordinances, see, or laws that they had to abide by. So he's blotting them out. No longer are they in effect now, because Yahshua, that was his purpose on that cross to blot out the handwriting of ordinances that was what, Deb? That was against us. It was against us because they couldn't keep that law. They just could not do it because they did not have the heart or they did not have the Holy Spirit in them to do it. And Yahshua knew that. Yahweh knew this was all happening. See, nothing's happened that he doesn't know about. So he blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against them. And what? Which was contrary to us. They were contrary to us. <laughs> and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Now he took that Old Testament uh, out of the way and he nailed it to the cross. Now, why would he use such a, a term as nailed to the cross? Well, we know that Yahshua was nailed, his hands and his feet, right? He was nailed to the cross. But listen, on your hands and your feet, you have nails, right? Don't they call them nails? Mm -hmm. yes. And I noticed the other day when I was somehow looking at my fingernails i don't know why but everybody look at their fingers and you will see that at the bottom of the finger you have a white area which is mm -hmm. a moon like mm -hmm. the moon is nailed to the cross and that old covenant is uh, likened onto the moon now mm -hmm. let's get that in uh the, the ordinances of the moon and where is that Jeremiah. That, yeah, of course. That's what we'll end with <laughs> Jeremiah 31 31. Hello. <laughs> Do you want it at 31? <laughs> sure. Okay. Why not? Jeremiah 31 31. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. I'm going to interrupt you, Gail. <laughs> Behold, the days come. <laughs> Oh, excuse me, saith Yahweh. So this is in Jeremiah, which is in the prophets, and it's way before Yahshua comes into the flesh, but he's saying, behold, the days come. So it's not happening now, but it's coming down the road, see? And behold, the days come, saith Yahweh. Go ahead. And I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. I acknowledge. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Excuse me, Yell, and that's 
where this old covenant came in is when he took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, brought them up into the, into the wilderness of Sinai, talked uh, into that covenant with them. That's the old covenant of the Old Testament. So this New Testament, see, not like the one that I did with them when I established that old covenant. Keep going. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith Yahweh. Mm -hmm. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith Yahweh, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their Elohim and they shall be my people. So after those days, which is the death, burial and resurrection of Yahshua, the Messiah, where he was nailed to the cross, blotted out that old, old Testament, see, nailed to the cross. After those days, saith Yahweh, I will put my law. Mm -hmm. Not the law of Moses. It's different now. It's my law or that law of spirit of life. He will put within your heart and in your mind so that you can worship him in spirit and in truth. And it's the only way that you're going to be able to worship him is if he puts that spirit in you. So keep going there where I want to get that moon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, 34, and they shall teach no man, every man, his neighbor and every man, his brother saying, no Yahweh, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith Yahweh, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. 35, thus saith Yahweh, which giveth the sun for a light by day and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night which divides the sea when the waves thereof roar, Yahweh of hosts is his name. So there's that ordinances of the moon by night, you know, and I'm going to go back to the prayer, that darkness, see, the, that darkness that's in the hearts and minds of man, see, and it's that moon that is representing the old covenant. So when he's nailed to the cross, see, we got nails. We got we got a witness right in your own body. You have nails on your feet and your nails on your hands, and you've got that moon that's nailed to the cross and it's gone. You see, and it's a mystery. The world does not know that. You know, we can't take uh, it for granted that we know this stuff that Yahshua has revealed, you know, his purpose to us at the end of this age and how important it is, you know, and the scripture reading, you know, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of Yahweh, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And that's what we have now in that new covenant is we have that eternal in the heavens, eternal life in Yahshua, the Messiah. And hallelujah that he has revealed that to us. So I hope that somebody got something out of that. Um, all praise and honor goes to Yahshua, the Messiah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Welch. And our next speaker this afternoon will be Dr. Cherie Williams from our Orlando class. Good evening, class. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah. we can. Okay. I thoroughly enjoyed the testimony of the previous speaker. And um, she did an excellent job laying the foundation and preaching the gospel of Yahshua the Messiah. Um, just as the previous speaker pointed out, the reason that we do come to class and we're in class, in other words, we're in school, 
we're not in church because we come to learn something about our heavenly father, Yahweh Elohim, through Yahshua the Messiah, who is our savior, who is our teacher, who is our comforter, our husband even. Uh, we come here to learn. And we wouldn't know anything about Yahweh's eternal purpose pattern and plan of salvation if he had not called up the founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kenley in the year of 1931 and instructed him to go in the world and teach uh, Yahshua's people his will. And because he was obedient to the divine vision and revelation, that's why we're blessed to be in school this evening, learning something about Yahweh's divine purpose pattern and plan of salvation. Um, let's pick up the scripture lesson and I'm going to skip around just a little bit because of the lack of time. But if you will start on uh, second Corinthians five, one through four, and when you're done with four, you stop there. And then we're going to skip around a little bit more. If you would, please. Thank you. Second Corinthians five and one. For we know that our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. We have a building of Yahweh, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Okay, hold it right there for just a minute. Okay, so now this is the Holy Spirit speaking through the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, talking about um, these tabernacles or these physical houses that we have on now being dissolved, and we have in a house. Uh, in the heavens that by which we will reside in and that is shortly to be uh, manifest down here we're right at the end of this present kingdom age uh, just before the universal revelation of Yahshua the Messiah where these physical bodies will be dissolved and we are going in to immortality which is the fifth age where we will uh the sabbath age as we see on the age and dispensation chart but um uh there is a process that must take place take place but go ahead and, and finish it i don't want to get ahead of myself go ahead for in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven mm -hmm. if so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not that we should be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Absolutely. So you see, immortality, that's these physical, natural bodies. These mortality or these physical bodies will be, um, what was that last sentence? Read swallowed that. up of life swallowed up of life and that's what's uh, going to happen at the universal revelation of Yahshua and Messiah okay so now if you'll drop down let's read uh the sixth verse and stop at six and then we're going to go to eight go ahead therefore we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body we are absent from Yahweh Absolutely. So as long as we have these physical bodies on, then we're absent from Yahweh, who is pure spirit. Okay. Verse A, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with Yahweh. Absolutely. So those of us that uh, are recipients of the Holy Spirit, right, we desire to be out of the flesh and be into pure spirit or immortality, okay? Uh, did you finish eight? Yes. Okay, now let's read 15. Verse 15. And that he died for all, that they who live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him who died for them and rose again. Absolutely. And that's our desire is to be obedient unto Yahshua, the Messiah who died for us. And we're not living this life. Uh, uh, in other words, doing what we want to do. You understand to 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 please ourselves and our desires. No, our desire is to be pleasing unto Yahweh Elohim Yahshua down here at the end of this age. OK, did you finish 15? I did. 
Let's go to 17. 17, therefore, if any man be in the Messiah, he's a new creature, or creature, mm -hmm. sorry. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Okay, so if you're in the body of Yahshua the Messiah, which is being in the kingdom, you're in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah, then you're a new creature in Yahshua the Messiah. Okay, did you finish 19? Uh, go to 19. To wit, that Yahweh was in the Messiah, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. The word of reconciliation by the preaching of the gospel of Yahshua the Messiah. And he will receive us and not holding any of our trespasses against us. You understand what I mean? You see, and receiving us in peace at the universal revelation. Now the last verse. Did, did the you want 20? 20, uh, no, 21. 21. For he hath made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that mm -hmm. we might be made the righteousness of Yahweh in him. Absolutely, that we might be made. We got to be made the righteousness of, of Yahweh you know, unto him, Yahshua the Messiah. Okay, so now let's look at it back in the law because we know what the rules of the game is, quote unquote, right? We must go to the law and to the prophets, right? We have to see Yahshua fulfilling it and see how he ushers us into the reality of the thing. So when we go back, uh, give me the Moses chart, if you would, please. Um, and we look at the migration of the children of Israel coming out of the land of Egypt through the divided waters of the Red Sea. Now we know they had the Passover feast in Egypt the night before they were delivered, right? And they had to have the lamb in them before they could be delivered, they, which was roasted. They had to have the bread in them before they were delivered and they drank the bitter herbs. And each thing on that menu is pointing to Yahshua the Messiah because Yahshua's the true lamb of Yahweh, right? He's that bread that came down from heaven. And he said, you know, uh, prayed the prayer the night before his crucifixion unto his heavenly father, Yahweh, let this bitter cup pass from before me, but not my will, your will be done. So that death out there on that cross was not a picnic. You understand? It was not fun. It was not pleasant. That was bitter. But he did that for you and I. So uh, so that had to be in them before they could be delivered. So then they have a two-day journey to the Red Sea and one-day journey through the Red Sea where they're baptized in the cloud and in the sea unto Moses, as we read in Exodus uh, 14.21, also uh, 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. So when they come through the divided waters of the Red Sea, um, it's a 47 day journey to uh, Mount Sinai. And we know that this is where Yahweh spoke his law into the hearing of the children of Israel after they had washed up and cleaned up for three whole days. And then June the 6th, he speaks his law. But the point I want to get at dealing with the scripture lesson is that uh, the children of Israel that were in the wilderness of Sinai right? Remember, they did not accept the true report of Yahshua and, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's Caleb, the two men that uh, gave a true report. They accepted the false report of the men that went over to Canaan's land and spied out the land. They received the false report of the tent, you know, and so Yahweh said that their carcasses or their physical bodies will rot in that wilderness there. So the point is that the old heads that came out of the land of Egypt, they all died off out here in this wilderness because after seeing the miracles, if you would, uh, of Yahweh, wherein he poured out those 10 devastating plagues down in the land of Egypt, they get out here in the wilderness and then they don't have confidence in Yahweh that they could take that land. So they had to wander in this wilderness for some 40 years and the old heads died off, right? And only three that were born in Egypt went on into Canaan's land. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, y'all. I think it's uh, uh, Eleazar, Phineas, and Caleb. 
and, and Kale, thank you very much, that went on into Canaan's land. Uh, and of course, Yahshua went over, but he was not born in Egypt. You understand what I'm saying? And he's the one that is going to lead them on into Canaan's land and fight all those battles for them. And uh, technically, he fought the battles in Egypt, but they didn't know it. He was in Cotton And he fought the battles in the wilderness for Israel there too, and also in Canaan's land. But the point is, it talks about in the scripture lesson that we are, are new creatures in Yahshua, the Messiah. So you're seeing that the old heads dying off, right? This, this migratory pattern is taking our picture, right? So the old you and I that first came to class, because the founder says it all the time that we all came to class dead on arrival, you know, and like it was pointed out in the prayer, you know, we were in total darkness. We didn't know nothing about Yahweh, Elohim, and Yahshua. We didn't even know he had, we didn't know his name. We all, all we had was Lord, God, and Jesus, you know, but we had to come to class and find out uh, about the holy name of Yahweh, Elohim, and Yahshua, the Messiah, you see, and then we, uh, had to be taught by Yahshua, who was the teacher in this class that we read about in John 14, 26, how to go to the law and the prophets. You know what I'm saying? So we just didn't know anything. Just like down here with the children of Israel, see that darkness in Egypt? They were delivered from that darkness, as he said in the prayer, you see? And we are delivered from darkness by the preaching of the gospel of Yahshua the Messiah as well. And so the old me and the old you that first came to class has to die off, you see? And we see that in a type and in a shadow back here with the children of Israel, how that all those old heads, they had to die off as they wandered in this wilderness for those 40 years. That's typifying the old me and the old you has to die off. You know, and so then we become new creatures in Yahshua the Messiah by the preaching of the gospel. Give me the brain chart, you see, and we're going to come back to this Moses chart. And we're seeing that the new birth goes on into Canaan's land, see. Okay, right. So you see how that says the old night, right? That's the old me. That's the old you. All of that must die off. Transgression, liar. You understand? Full of hell, full of strife, you know, condemnation, uh, full of hate and greed. Uh, we're con carnal, uh, carnal minded, which is death, you know, full of ignorance, uncircumcised, full of anger, got pride, lust and all such. You understand? All of that stuff, you see, must die off. That's the old me, the old you, the old night. You see, it's got to be cast out, you see. And then the Holy Spirit is put therein. Now you are humble now. You're stable. You have love now. You're spiritually minded now, which is life. You're circumcised from all of that wickedness. You have, you, you're just now. You got peace now. All of that is, you got the truth now. You understand what I'm saying? All of that is Yahshua and the Messiah quicken in our hearts and in our minds that's that new creature now that is taking on shape and form as we sit in class hearing the preaching of the gospel of Yahshua the Messiah you know but Yahshua he had to die on that cross because he was the only one walking around you see with the Holy Spirit in him he was the kingdom walking around on the face of the earth and that's why he said that he had to die so that uh, uh, they, he was talking to the Hebrews at that time so that they could be where he was and where he was was in heaven in a physical body walking the face of the earth. He was the kingdom of Yahweh in a body walking the face of the earth. And so he has prepared a way that we can be where he is. That's John the 14th chapter. I think it was in, um, uh, which class was that recently? We had uh, John 14th chapter was our scripture lesson, you know, and we want to be where he was at that time where he said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, ye may be also. He didn't say where I'm going, but that where I am, ye may be. And that's being in heaven. Like he said, it's not a place, it's a state of mind. You know what I'm saying? In the kingdom, you see, 
and a physical body right now before the universal revelation of Yahshua Messiah. Okay, let's go back to the Moses chart. Okay, so now uh, when they cross that Jordan, that's the new birth that's crossing over now. So when they cross over that Jordan, over there in, in uh, Canaan's land, you see, they have fruit so big, uh, it's on a pole and it takes two men to carry them. And those fruits, you see that they receive over there in Cana's land, right? It uh, typifies the fruit of the spirit as we're looking at here on the right hand side. This is the new day. You get what I'm saying? This is the new creature in Yahshua Messiah that those fruits, that, that, that grapes and all of those fruits that they got when they crossed that Jordan is typifying. So that is that new creature in Yahshua the Messiah. Okay, let's go back to the Moses chart. And we're looking at the children of Israel crossing that Jordan, going into Canaan's land. All right. So now we're seeing the old head dying off, but the new birth, right? And 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 we read about it, about the 144,000. You understand what I'm saying? That crossed that Jordan, you see, and went into Canaan's land. That's all the children that were born in that land of Egypt. I mean, excuse me, in the wilderness of Sinai, that new birth is what's crossing on over and getting as it were their inheritance getting all those great fruits getting houses they didn't build and vineyards they didn't plant you get what i'm saying just everything given to her on a silver platter so you see in that manifest what it's talking about in the scripture lesson back here in a type in this migration of the children of israel so you're seeing that in the holy place of this migratory pattern right? Egypt is the court roundabout. Um, the wilderness is the holy place. And Canaan's land is the most holy place, right? So it's in the wilderness of Sinai or in the holy place where that change is taking place, right? So now when we examine the day of atonement, when the priest went in there, that was the only day he was allowed to go into that most holy place, right? He goes into uh, the the most holy place with blood. You get sprinkling toward that mercy seat, right? And then that's the first trip. He comes all the way back out into the court roundabout after that first trip. Then when he goes back in, this is October the 10th, goes back in the second time with more blood, right? And he's Sprinkles the blood to seven more times, making 14 in that most holy place. Why don't we get the chart, uh, the tabernacle man chart? You can see that tabernacle a little bit better, if you don't mind, please. Um, he goes in there the second trip. Oh, okay. We could do that. All right. Um, the second trip, that's 14 sprinkles of blood, right? But now when he comes out of that most holy place, that second, after that second trip into the most holy place, he doesn't come back into the court roundabout anymore, right? What does he do? He, uh, there has to be a change. That's what I'm getting at. There's a change that takes place in the holy place of this tabernacle pattern here. You get it? Uh, um, when he comes out of the most holy place, that second trip. Now, what does he do? He has to take off uh, the linen garment stained with the blood of the uh, sacrifice, right? And uh, he takes that off. He takes uh, takes out of this altar of incense uh, water that's in there. He washed himself up and get rid of that blood and all of that. And now what does he do? He has to put on the clothes of beauty and glory. So you see how that the change is taking place in the holy place of this tabernacle, right? Just like in the holy place of the migration, you got a change taking place with the children of Israel, the old heads dying off and the new birth is taking place in the holy place of the migratory pattern and the new birth goes on into the most holy place, typifying, you know, receiving their inheritance or going on into immortality in a type. You see, but now he has a change taking place. He puts on the clothes of beauty and glory, and he has on that breastplate uh, um, with the 12 stones in the breastplate and the names 
of the 12 tribes engraved on those stones. And he also has the, uh, uh, on his shoulders there, the, uh, e what is it? The ephod, is, am I saying it right? In other words, uh, six names of, of six tribes on one shoulder and six tribes on the other shoulder. You get what I mean? And he's going on into the most holy place the third time, as it were, in a type, taking the children of Israel in with him. You understand? And sprinkling that blood seven more times, making 21 sprinkles of blood toward that mercy seat. And then he stands there and he tarries and he waits, expecting to see the Shekinah, you know, of, which is a flash of light in that most holy place, you see, typifying that Yahweh had forgiven Israel for the, their sin for a whole, for that past year. You know what I'm saying? So then what happens? He backs on out of there. You see, after that third trip and he gets that shaking eye. Now it's got to be a change in the holy place again. What does he do? He has to take off the clothes of beauty and glory, put them back in that altar of incense, put back on the linen garments before he can come back down into the court roundabout. He can never come, bring, come out into uh, the court roundabout with those clothes of beauty and glory. So the principle is in the holy place, you see, there is a change that must take place. So that's why you, you see uh, how that when they did go into the most holy place, you could back up now and cross that Jordan, there's a change that takes place there. Because remember, uh, the tabernacle stood on Mount Zion for, it was in the wilderness for 40 years, right? Then it was on Mount Zion for another 450 years, making a total of 490 years. Now the last 10 years from 480 to 490, you got Solomon building this temple, right? And he's making more vessels. So what's happening is the vessels that are in this tabernacle are being, as it were, dissolved into the temple along with the other vessels that he's building and that is in this temple. So this tabernacle typified uh, the sacrificial body of Yahshua the Messiah or that special prepared body, right? And the temple typifies his spiritual body, you see? So you're seeing that the vessels in the tabernacle are being dissolved into the temple along with the other vessels that are being built. So in other words, in the tabernacle pattern, you got one candlestick, but in the temple, you got 10. In the tabernacle, you got one table of showbread, but in the temple, you got 10. You follow me? And the... Uh, um, in the tabernacle, there's one altar of incense where there's a prayer offered up unto Yahweh daily there. And in the temple is still that stuff saying one uh, altar of incense in that temple because Yahshua is the only intercessor between us and Yahweh. So they can't make multiple uh, altars of incense, only one. Okay. All right. Then you have like, uh, you got that, that one. Uh, labor there in the tabernacle they had several in the temple you got the big bath and you got other smaller baths and everything when you do your research on that that temple and uh you got that uh the altar of of ins i mean the altar of uh of sacrifice that's in there and they got several as well and then when you go on on into the most holy place of this uh temple here then you got those big angels, you see, that are hovering over that Ark of the Covenant because you still only have that one Ark of the Covenant there with, you know, Gabriel and Michael. Let's get that bigger. Let's go to the Tabernacle of Man chart. I'm still trying to get you to see that. Uh, yes, thank you very much. So you see that altar, I uh, mean, the, the Ark of the Covenant, which you got the two archangels representing Gabriel and Michael, right? Now in that temple, uh, there are two huge angels and their wings are spanning across, right? And, and it's, they're hovering over the Ark of the Covenant, right? And the wings are, are touched together in the middle and one wing touched the right side 
of the temple and then the other one on the other side his wings touching the other side of the temple and the wings are uh, meeting in the, in the middle there so you got the great angels in there and the, all the angels on the um, veils and whatnot in the temple it's on a greater a greater scale and it's just glorious and the walls of the temple they are paved with gold uh, inside and out, so much so that when the noonday sun shone or shine on that temple there, it said that it, it blinded it, everything all around it because it's typifying the spiritual body of Yahshua the Messiah. And remember in the prayer, it was talking about he has put us in his marvelous light and it's manifest with that temple there in the, uh, in the most holy place of the migratory pattern. So you read that part again about the uh, being dissolved. That's the first verse in the, in the scripture lesson. I'll read it. For we know that if our earthly house, talking about the physical body, of this tabernacle were dissolved. So it's got to be dissolved. And you're seeing it manifest with this tabernacle, the vessels being dissolved as it were out of the tabernacle and dissolved into that temple. That's what's happening. These physical bodies got to be dissolved. And we have a building of Yahweh, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And when you look at that uh, uh, Moses chart, you see Yahweh Elohim standing there and they're seeing Yahweh Elohim. That is the house, if you will, you understand? That's in heaven. And that's what they're looking at, a heavenly body he, you know, a clear body in, in heaven in his clearness. I'm not quoting it right. <laughs> Exodus 24, 9, when they're describing Yahweh Elohim, and, and they say he has hands, feet, and a body, heaven in his clearness, as a heavenly body in his clearness. So at the universal revelation of Yahshua the Messiah, and we know that's Yahshua. You see it on there? The head region says Yahweh, the chest region say Elohim, and down here it says Joshua, so because these three are one. The previous speaker talked about he is a unity. And it said in the scripture lesson, you see, that he's going to gather all things within him that are in heaven and in earth. That is his, his will, Yahweh's divine will, to gather all things back into Yahshua the Messiah. And he's our mode of transportation back into Yahweh or back into a pure spirit. You know what I'm saying? You, you see? So let's get um second Thessalonians, I believe it's uh one and seven, and then Colossians uh one, 12, 13, and 26, and I'm done. I, ho I hope you were able to follow me because this is a beautiful principle uh, that's in the scripture lesson manifest in this migratory pattern. And it's also manifest with the dissolving of the tabernacle into the temple that's, uh, uh, that's in, the, the pro in the prophecy. So you see the migration of children of Israel, that's in the law, and then dealing with the temple, that's in the prophecy. So we're trying to be obedient to the teacher, Yahshua Messiah, by going to the law and the prophecy with this principle of being dissolved into the temple or into a heavenly body. Okay, go ahead. Second Thessalonians 1 and 7. Mm -hmm. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. Yes. When Yahshua the Messiah shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Okay, hold it right there. So when Yahshua the Messiah shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. See, now, ever since we've been in class, Yahshua has been revealing himself to us by knowledge and understanding by way of this great divine vision and revelation given to Dr. Kinley in 1931. But at his universal revelation, right, then he's going to be revealed universally to the entire world. And that those of us, you know, okay, I, I see the five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, that have uh, been obedient to Yahshua and have been uh, uh, given the Holy Spirit, you know, like he said in the prayer, uh, snatch out of the clutches, if you would, of Satan, which is that true darkness. You understand? He has delivered us from that darkness and put us in his marvelous light right now today by the preaching of the gospel. You get what I'm saying? You see? So now we will be 
those recipients of the Holy Spirit at his universal revelation will be those fired up angels that appear with him at his universal revelation and our bodies will be like his, you see. So, okay, read that again. Second Thessalonians 1 and 7. Mm -hmm. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When yes. Yahshua the Messiah shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. With his mighty angels. Hallelujah. That's the brethren. You understand? Full of the Holy Spirit. Go ahead. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not Yahweh. In flame and fire, because Yahweh our Elohim is what? A consuming fire. In flame and fire, taking <laughs> vengeance on them that know not Yahweh. That's why to know him is eternal life. And what? And that obey not the gospel of our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah. And that obey not the gospel of our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah. That's why we're going to preach the gospel of Yahshua the Messiah till our last breath. We're going to be obedient to Yahweh's righteousness, which is in Yahshua the Messiah, who obey not the gospel of our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah. Read on. Nine, who shall be punished? with everlasting destruction from the presence of Yahweh and from the glory of his power. And they're going to be punished, everlasting mm -hmm. punishment. You understand? That's like being in a nightmare. You understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. With no end. You follow me? I don't want me none of that. So I want to be obedient to the righteousness of Yahweh and Yahshua the Messiah. Let's go to Colossians and I'm done. Colossians 1, 12 and 13 and then 26. Thanks unto the Father who hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the sons in light. Yes. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness mm -hmm. and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Yes, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, Yahshua the Messiah. And I heard Dr. Kimmy recently say this on SoundCloud. He said, look, in the antediluvian age, you had Enoch, which was translated without seeing death. In the post-diluvian age, you had Elijah, which was translated without seeing death. And he said, in this present kingdom age, you see, he has translated us into the kingdom without seeing death. And isn't that just wonderful? It's so exciting, you know, that that's what Yahshua has done for us in this school. Give me 26 and I'm done. Did you finish it? I'm sorry. Did yeah. you finish even it? The, even the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his sons, to whom Yahweh would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Yahshua in you, the hope of glory. Yahshua the Messiah in us, our only hope of glory. All praises and honor go to Yahweh our Elohim through Yahshua the Messiah, our Savior. Hallelujah. Thank you, Dr. Williams. And I will defer back to the Dean, Dr. Dennis Volpe, for our third speaker announcement. Uh, Dennis sent it to me by mistake. It, it, it's Dr. Rick Trevison. Can you repeat that? Rick Trevison. Uh, hi, everybody. Hi. Am uh, I Rick. the speaker? Yes. So, Dr. Trivison, yes. Okay. Uh, well, there's been a lot of uh, information brought out thus far. And uh, I'm going to, I think, key in on one aspect of it. Uh, you know, our class used to be a very big class. And um, there was a time when, oh, starting in 94, 93, 94, and, and uh, there were a lot of troubles that beset our class. And 
I think it was finally 97 and the class split. But before the class split, there were a lot of strange things that went on. One of them was there were certain words that were buzzwords. And one of the buzzwords was information. There were a lot of people who did not like us using the word information. That's right. We were not supposed to use that word. We were not supposed to do this. We were not supposed to do that. There were a lot of ordinances that were set up or that were, they were trying to set up. And one day we went there and half the class was gone. I mean, they were just gone. And uh, it was like this huge knot was gone from the pits of our stomachs. But anyway, this chapter, uh, the fifth chapter, Second Corinthians. Uh, let me get over here. Um, it, it has some very interesting things in it. And uh, the first couple verses, you could spend all the rest of the time on that. In fact, you could spend uh, an hour or two just on that. But I want to key in on something else. Um, let's pick this up in um, I want to pick up four. Uh, well, for now, let's pick up four. Second, second Corinthians five and four. Now he that brought us for the self same thing is Yahweh, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the spirit. Now he has given unto us the earnest or the interest of the spirit. He has brought for us these self same things, which is has talked about in the prior verses uh, and has also given unto us the earnest of the spirit. He has given unto us that spirit which has taken us out of that darkness as your speakers talked about, as your prayer talked about taken us out of that darkness and into his marvelous light. Now, I would like to pick up uh, verse 1. I think it's this, the 12th verse. Number 12. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, no, we, we don't come, we're not commending ourselves unto you, and we're not glorying in ourselves. Mm -hmm. We hope to give the glory to Yahshua. We hope to give the glory to Yahweh. The glory belongs with him because none of us that are speaking tonight would know anything about any of these things if he had not given this information to us. I, uh, I went to higher education and uh, then I went in the service and uh, I should say I was dragged into the service. And when I got out, 
I went and spent three or four more years of higher in higher education on the GI Bill. So I had a lot of a lot of higher education and never learned any of these kinds of things. They never told me anything about Yahweh. They never told me anything about the interest of the spirit, about the earnest of the spirit. They never told me anything about a tabernacle. They never told me anything about even the name of my creator. All those years of college, all those years. And I took courses in philosophy too. Studied the ancient Greeks, studied all the modern philosophies and studied the Plato and Aristotle and all of them. And never, never once even heard the name Yahweh. Never heard any of that kind of stuff. I didn't hear anything about any of this stuff until I came down to a class. So the answers aren't out there. Not as far as I'm concerned. You have to get the answers from the creator himself. Only he is going to give you these answers. Keep reading in that verse uh, for me, Gail, please, if you would. And 12. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that you may have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in heart. That you, that you, you see, this isn't about the appearance. This is about the heart. And your second speaker there talked about how it, in the in the uh, in the holy place of the pattern, there was always a change. There was always a change. In every one of the events that you read about, there was a change. For instance, we're looking at the migratory track here. And when Israel came up out of Egypt and they were standing there at the Red Sea and Pharaoh was behind them, They said to Moses, did you bring us up here to die? And they, were, they, they cried and they complained and they murmured. And he said, stand still and see the salvation of Yahweh. In fact, let's get that verse. Is it in the fourth, fourth chapter? Exodus 14, 13. Oh, 14th chapter. Exodus 14 and 13. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, stand still, and now see the salvation. Not, fear not, stand still. Now, when he tells them to stand still, he doesn't mean... Stop dead in your tracks. He means stand still in your minds. Stand still in your hearts. Be quiet inside yourselves. Stand still. Just like when we have to come to class, we have to stand still. We can't all be talking and saying, yeah, but what about, what about this and what about that and debating and all talking at the same time? It would be a Tower of Babel. It would be absolute chaos. We have to sit there and be quiet and listen to the Holy Spirit instruct us from the floor. That's how 
the founder, that's how Yahshua, in his infinite wisdom, set it up. We have to stand still. Is that what it said, Deb? Yes, fear not, stand still and see the salvation of Yahweh, which he will show to you today. Which he will show to you today. And then we all understand that Israel went, the, the waters were parted, Israel went through, and then when Pharaoh tried to follow them with 600 soldiers, 600 horses, and 600 chariots, or 666, that the waters closed upon them and they were drowned in the Red Sea. So when they were on one side of the Red Sea, they were crying and they were scared and they were frightened. When they got on the other side of the Red Sea, they did a, a dance and a song of victory. And you can read about it in the 14th and 15th chapters of Exodus. They danced and they sang. So there was a change that took place in their hearts. They were happy. They were glad. They had been scared and frightened and now they were overjoyed. Do you see there was a change that took place? And it's looked like when you look at the uh, the elementary chart, every time you get into the holy place of these events, there's a change that takes place in the holy place of each one of these events. I don't want to call them stories because they were actual events. They actually occurred. They weren't myths. They weren't tales. They were actual events. These things happen. And there's always a change that takes place in that holy place. Just like with that, uh, on the green chart, you know that there's that plate of the metamorphosis. And you have the larva goes into that chrysalis. Okay, and this is the holy place now of the pattern. And inside the chrysalis, momentous changes take place. Momentous changes take place. And it went in as a larva and it comes out as a gorgeous butterfly. So that's quite a change that takes place. That's what metamorphosis means. It's no longer the same creature. It no longer eats the same foods. It no longer hangs around with the, with the same creatures. It's airbound. It's not bound to the ground. It's a heavenly creature. It's not an earthly creature. Everything about it is different. A change had taken place in the burial or in the holy place. And your second speaker was keying in on that. Same thing takes, takes place with your seasons. You have the, the fall. There's a, there's a death in the autumn of the year. And then 
in the winter, which we're in now, we get buried in snow. Now this winter, it's been cold, it's been tough, but we haven't had the snow we ordinarily get, but it's far from over. Anyway, ordinarily we get buried with snow, buried with snow. And then you have on the right side of that tree, you have the springtime and you have a change that took place. And if you don't have that burial, if we don't get that snow in the winter, if we don't go through that burial, we don't get that beautiful greenery we have here in the summertime. And it's not fun going through droughts. There's always a change that takes place in that holy place. And that's what it's talking about here. That we want we glory not in appearance. We glory not in appearance, but in the heart. And I just want to talk for a few minutes about the heart. Let's go to Deuteronomy 529. Deuteronomy. Go ahead, Gail. Okay. 5 and 29. Oh, that there was such a heart in them. Who is this would... speaking, Gail? Um, Yahshua, or Yahweh the, to the people. The, this is Yahweh, Elohim. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh, that there was such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always. So that he's it, telling, he's talking to Moses and he's saying, oh, that there was such a heart in them. In who? In Israel. He knew that Israel did not have the heart in them that they needed to have. They did not have the heart in them to keep the commandments that he was going to give them, that he had given them. He knew that they did not have that heart in them. And the time was gonna come when he was gonna have to give them that heart or they would never, never be able to, to be obedient to his law and to love him like he deserved to be loved. Now, run over to uh, Jeremiah 523. Jeremiah 5 and 23, but this people hath a revolting and a rebellious heart. Now this people, this is Yahweh Elohim, uh, right, Deb? Yep. Okay. This people have what, Deb? Has a revolting and a rebellious heart. This people, who are the people he's talking about? Israel. This Israel. He's not talking about Edom here. He's not talking about Moab. He's not talking about the Babylonians. He's talking about Israel. This people have a revolting. Read it again. But this people hath a revolting and a rebellious heart. They are revolted and gone. They are revolted and gone. They have a revolting rebellious heart. Jeremiah 9.26. Jeremiah 9.26. Egypt and Judah and Edom and the children of Ammon and Moab and all that are at the utmost corners that dwell in the wilderness 
For all these nations are uncircumcised, and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in her. And he lists all these pagan nations. Mm -hmm. And then he says, and the house of who? Israel. The house of Israel are what? Uncircumcised They're in heart. Uncircumcised where? In their heart. In the heart. In their heart. They have an uncircumcised heart. Now this is <laughs> this is back in Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. Now pick up uh, Well, let's pick up Jeremiah 4.4. 4. Jeremiah 4 and 4. Circumcise yourselves to Yahweh and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Read that Jeremiah again, Deb. Circumcise yourselves to Yahweh and take away the foreskins of your heart. Now he's talking to who, Deb? Jerusalem. Talking the to of Jerusalem and of Judah. Yes, to Jerusalem and Judah, and he's saying, circumcise the foreskin of your heart. Now, obviously, this is a prophecy because they had no way of of uh, they had no capability of doing that back at that time. They had no circumcision was a physical right back then at that time. Circumcision was of the flesh. But he's telling them to circumcise their heart. All down through the law and the prophets, you're going to see he's telling them to circumcise their heart. Read. Lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. Because of the evil of your doings. Ezekiel eleven nineteen. 19. Ezekiel 11 and 19. <clears throat> and I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within you and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and will give them a heart of flesh. Now he's talking about Israel, right? Yep. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. 20, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them and they shall be my people and I will be their Elohim. And I will be their Elohim. And now we're going to go over to the 36th chapter of Ezekiel and start reading in 24. Ezekiel 36, 24. I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. And you then will clean. I sprinkle clean water upon you the clean water is not physical water folks it's the truth it's the gospel it's the how Yahshua died for our sins according for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And listen, let's not forget that the heart is in the holy place of your physical tabernacle. The heart is in your thoracic cavity or your chest cavity. And that's where this change has to take place. It's got to take place in your heart or in your soul. Now, keep reading, please, Steph. Mm -hmm. And gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean. 
and you all your will be clean. Clean from what, Deb? From all your filthiness, from all your idols, will Listen, I cleanse from you. from all your filthiness. Oh, I think it's Jesus. Hey, that's filthiness. I think it's a trinity. Hey, that's filthiness. I think it's Dr. Kinley. Hey, that's filthiness. All these things are idols. And they're, and they're blasphemous. And they're filthiness. And he's going to clean us up from all of it. Where? In our heart. In our very soul. In our inner man, where that change takes place. Read, please. A new heart also will I give you, oh, and a new spirit. A new heart will I give you. Going to give us a new heart, folks. And he's not, he's not doing a heart transplant. He's just giving us a new heart. Read. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. A new I... spirit will I put within you. Read. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. I will take the hard heart, the un feeling heart the cold heart out of your flesh read and we'll give you a heart of flesh and i will give you a warm heart a feeling heart a loving heart how's that for change read and i will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And I will cause you. I will cause you. You are not doing it of your own volition. He will cause you to walk in his statutes. Uh, that's good, Deb. I want to go over to uh, Romans 2. And five. Romans two and five. But after thy hardness and impenitent impen heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of Yahweh. Who will render to every man according to his deeds. He will render to every man according to his deeds. There's a, there's a heart that's impenitent. There's a heart that's impenitent. Now, let's, real quick, let's get Romans 2, 28 and 29. 28. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. See, that circumcision is no longer outward in the flesh because we're talking now after Pentecost. This is taking place after Pentecost. Paul is writing this after Pentecost. And the circumcision is no longer in the physical flesh. Read. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. He's a Jew who is one inwardly. Read. And circumcision is that of the heart. And circumcision now is that of the heart. Just like he prophesied back there in Jeremiah 4.4 4, and back there in the law and all the way down to the book. Oh, that they had such a heart in them. Thank you. Go ahead, read. In the spirit and not in the letter. In the spirit and not in the letter. It's not written in pen and ink. It's not in tables of stone. 
It's written in your heart. Oh, pray for me. Hebrews 4.12. Hebrews 4 and 12. For the word of Yahweh is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And the thoughts and intents of the heart. He can read your heart. He knows the intents of your heart. And I know Bruce always likes to go over there to, uh, uh, well, I think it's Jeremiah 17, 9, where it talks about the heart is wicked above all things, or something to that effect. I'm paraphrasing. Deceitful above all things. And so he had to give us a new heart. He had to change our heart. Oh, goodness. We're going to have to get uh, uh, Psalms 19 and 7. Psalms 19 and 7. The law of Yahweh is perfect. Now, the law of Yahweh is perfect. And the law of Yahweh is Yahshua. The law of Yahweh is Yahshua. And he is perfect. We don't have time to get it down through the book, but his work is perfect. And he is perfect. Read. Converting the soul. Now that's how your heart gets changed. It's by him. It's by Yahshua. It's by the Holy Spirit. And only, O-N-L-Y, by the Holy Spirit in you. Can that heart be changed? It's the only way. You aren't changing your own heart. You ain't going to do it. Get Hebrews 10. Start reading in 22. Hebrews 10 in 22. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Oh, uh, pick it up in 21, Deb. And having a high priest over the house of Yahweh, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Let us draw near with a true heart and assurance of faith. Let us draw near, read. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Let us, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. You see? There, our hearts no longer have that evil conscience. Our hearts no longer have that condemnation. Our hearts are sprinkled from that evil. They're cleansed. He has, he has cleansed our hearts. Read. And our bodies washed with pure water. And our bodies washed with pure water. Now go back to the scripture reading and uh, read that seventh verse again. Not seven, um, 12. Second Corinthians 5 and 12. For we commend not ourselves again unto you. But no, we're not commending ourselves, Gail, right? Right. Read. We don't. But for we commend not ourselves again unto you but give you occasion to glory on our behalf that you might have somewhat to answer them, which glory in appearance and not in heart. See, we want a glory in our heart and only through the Holy Spirit in our heart can we glory. And we give the glory to Yahshua. We give all the glory to Yahweh. All glory belongs to Yahweh. And Yahshua, his son. Thank you very much for this time. Thank you, Dr. Trevison. 
We'd like to thank everybody who joined us on our Zoom class today. And we'd also like to thank those who have viewed us on YouTube. We hold our Zoom class every Saturday from 4 to 6 p.m. Pacific time. At this time, I'd like to ask the class to stay muted until the recording has ended. We'll now be dismissed by the doxology, which is taken from the last two verses of the book of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time and now and ever. Let us all say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah.